All right, welcome to another episode of Around the County with Supervisor Jim Desmond. I'm Miles Himmel, Communications Director for County Supervisor uh, Jim Desmond in District 5. And today we're going to focus on schools reopening. I know it's a hot topic and it's, it's not just a, a big issue in the United States, it's a big issue uh, globally, as you'll hear. And so today we've got Professor Simon Burgess uh, from the uh, a Professor of Economics at the University of Bristol, I believe, Simon. And uh, if you don't mind, kind of start us, start us off and, and, and even without COVID, just kind of what, what, what do you do? What's, what's your role? Okay, so I'm an economist. Um, I use the tools of economics to understand uh, how an education system works, so schools and teachers and pupils, and try and think about the policies that we can use to, to make the school system, the education system run better. Easy enough, and so well, how is it how is it playing out in the UK? I'm sorry, just how is it playing out in the UK with schools now? And and you know, I look, I, I watch or I listen to I, I, uh, if the, uh, the situation is so what, what's the situation in the UK with schools right now? Okay, so schools. So right now, schools are meant to be open. Uh, schools were closed. Um, from the beginning of the pandemic in mid-March all the way through to June. Um, schools opened for a few weeks for very young children, um, five, six years old. Um, but all the schools were meant to open in uh, September at the start of the new school year, and, and they more or less did. But what we're seeing over the last um, few weeks, the last couple of months, is that um, at the moment we don't have that kind of disaggregated data down to pupil level or even school level. But, but the, the thing that is completely true is that the areas where schools are um, uh, less open, there are fewer pupils there, are the areas poorer, more disadvantaged and so on. So the kids who can least afford to lose school are, are indeed out of school. Well, and when you say attendance, um, here we've got some students attending online only or distance learning uh, versus actually attendance in classrooms. And uh, I, I think most of us, most of our students, I'm not sure what the averages are, uh, just know from uh, locally here, are attending online as opposed to going, going to the classes. Okay, yeah, uh, very good point. I, I meant attending in, in person, face to face. So, I, so you know, all of the students who are not in class should be at home to learn online. But I mean, I think one of the things that we've we've really learned over this over this period is that online learning is very hard um, <clears throat> and is generally not very effective. There are definitely going to be yeah. some families, I'm sure, in in San Diego, and the same in the UK, where it's very effective and very enjoyable. Um, but those those are definitely in a minority for. Most families, I'd say it's somewhat effective. Children learn something, but not a great deal. And again, for the families that are, you know, maybe the ones that we want to focus on a little bit more, the disadvantaged families, they're really struggling. They're really struggling to learn much at all. So they're falling farther behind. So fat, we're talking about um, households where there really isn't a room, you know, a separate room for the child to study quietly talking about um, internet access and all those, all those kind of tech stuff as well. And, and of course, obviously, you, the, if you have educated parents, then it's easier for them to teach their child. If you have parents who are somewhat less educated for whatever reason, it's harder for them to teach their child. So I, I guess maybe at the start of all this in March, people were reasonably optimistic. You know, we're, we're in a networked world now. Everything can continue. But I, I think we've realized that teaching needs teachers. And without teachers, if you've got two parents, however hard they're trying, and I'm, I'm sure they all are, to educate their child, um, that just doesn't work as well. So all the time we're out, of, where kids are out of school, they're missing out. They're losing skills. Well, and it is unfortunate because um, the, the more disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods, socioeconomic dis disadvantage, uh, a lot of their parents, both parents work. Uh, potentially, and so they're they're not at home, and or in the more affluent uh, communities, they can hire tutors. They can hire people to come in and teach their kids, and and so it's really even. Not only are they getting more, they're more disadvantaged by more 
COVID testing, positive testing. And like you said, these are the kids that really need to be reached out to and, and have, you know, help to be brought along education wise. Miles, I interrupted you. I saw you, you had a question. No, 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 this is fine. And I actually, it's funny, we were talking about internet. I had some internet problems in the beginning. So I don't know, Simon, if you mentioned this, but, uh, you know, one of the things that the way I found you, Simon, was um, this study that you started. So if you don't mind, let folks kind of know about this study first, why you did it, and then kind of the findings from it. So we, um, uh, the, we were asked by um, uh, the Royal Society, which is uh, the, the oldest independent scientific institution in the world, um, to, 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 to write a big sort of survey of the, of the evidence on this. And we were, the, the kind of the, the perspective we took was about balancing risks. <clears throat> you know, there are no certainties in a, There are no certainties in any world. There are certainly no certainties in a, in a COVID world. Um, and so balancing the risks of schools being open and, and schools being closed. And I think the, the, the main overarching finding uh, that we came up with was that the evidence that schools being closed is harmful is very strong. There's a lot of evidence been been replicated many times. Children, as we were just discussing, children miss out on learning. Um, they lose skills, they lose um, future earnings, their, their future life chances are reduced. That in turn, of course, um, means that they're probably not gonna live as long, their life expectancy. I mean, you can die of poverty just as you can die of COVID. So in a sense, you, you are balancing the two things. And so the, the reduced um, life chances for children missing out on a lot of schooling uh, will, um, yeah, will reduce their life chances unless some kind of remediation is possible to, to make that better. You know, the risks of schools being open tends to get a lot of headlines. Um, I mean, I don't know whether we're going to talk about that. Um, but the, the, the risk of schools being shut uh, to children's futures is, is much sort of um, uh, less remarked upon, but is, is, is huge. And I think probably in the end going to be the, the bigger problem. Well, what are the pushbacks that we always get on, uh, you know, with balancing, and, and I agree with you, we have to balance risks. The one of the pushbacks that we get is, okay, these kids go to school and now they are spreaders of the virus. If they all go in it and they're attendants and they're spreading the virus, was there a, 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 a pro-con or a balance tipping in one way or the other of the risk of spreading the disease among children and among other people versus the loss of education? I mean, it, it, there's, they're both, we have to achieve both. But, and, I, and how do we was there any sort of recommendations <clears throat> that came out of the study or that, that you, you were able to determine? And again, the, the, the evidence on the other side, the evidence of um, the risk to having schools open is, is not so strong. The evidence that we have, all of the evidence that I've seen that we have so far suggests that children, young children are very unlikely to be severely ill, very, very unlikely to be severely ill. They're less likely to, be, to become infected and they're less likely to transmit the disease. Older children in schools are more like young adults, so they're, they're, they, they're not quite so low in those things. But all of the studies that we've seen suggest that opening schools has not led to uh, you know, a large number of new outbreaks and a large number of new infections. That's from different countries around the world. And actually, I was just reading something uh, from the Boston Globe this afternoon uh, about um, looking at Massachusetts and, and their you know, they found um, that uh, the, the, the number of sort of um, transmission events that started in a school was very, very small. So there, you know, there definitely are mm. teachers, there definitely are children who have become infected, but the evidence in, in that report suggests that it's, the, it's outside of school is where they become infected. And the trans schools themselves do not appear to be important in transmitting the disease from one to another. So the idea is that um, you know if 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 things are bad if if the if the community levels of infection are high, you should close lots of other things before you close the schools. So you know you should have the bars closed, you should have the restaurants closed, you should have the gyms closed before you close schools. Well, and and I, I tend to agree with you, and in, even even <clears throat> with restaurants and 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 places like that, bars maybe not so much or pubs, but the um, in a restaurant, it's a much more controlled, you know, food handling and masks and everything else. It's when people get home and they're not wearing the mask and they let their guard down. 
and when they're out in the community with the friends and family and things like mm -hmm. that, uh, that seems to be <clears throat> riskier than, you know, an institution like the school and things like that. But, well, you know, what about, a, you know, the, a, the other pushback I get is um, <clears throat> there's a multi-generations living within a household. Okay, so the grandparents are there. Uh, along with along with the, the grandchild or grandchildren that are going going to school, and um, <clears throat> I guess my response has been, well, then we have to just you have to take more precautions to make sure the mask wearing in, in the in the household, you know, so that you know we we protect the elderly <clears throat> who are the most vulnerable, and we're still educating the children who absolutely need this. Yeah. Oh, so I completely agree with you. I mean, I think, and I don't think there's a magic answer there. I mean, I think um, if, there are, if there are, you know, more elderly people, vulnerable people in a dungeon, then we, they have to be educated and we have to try and look after and guard, shield the, the, the more vulnerable people in the house. You know, you, you said right at the beginning, open schools safely. So that's exactly right. So there are all sorts of precautions people are taking in schools around the world to, to try and minimize yet further the infection in a school, um, which I'm sure I'm sure are going on in, around the United States as they are everywhere to, in, in open schools. But yeah, no, you're right. I mean, and I think I think the point is if, if schools are shut, you know, children are not necessarily literally just going to sit in their bedrooms for months on end. They're going to go out, they're going to play, they're going to be with their friends. Um, and that's not necessarily safer than being in a school. Uh, and my daughter, actually, she teaches third grade uh, here in uh, the San Diego area, and she, she does it online. She's distance learning with her, her class, about 25 children. And, you know, she said she'll have, you know, as you mentioned, if somebody doesn't have a separate room, I think one of the children, their older brother came in the room and started playing video games and you could hear the video came in the background and, yeah. and the older brother was not so uh he uh, it was it, kind of distracting so it's not the most ideal and, and you, the kids need that social interaction and uh you know I, oh I, absolutely i mean and, and that's that's a very good point i mean schools the, the main thing that schools provide is learning and raising the, the skills of the children who are there but they also provide a hugely important space for socialization for the mental health of the children you know, maybe in some schools, that's the only, that's the best meal of the day that children get. They get a chance to play sports, run around, get fresh air. So schools are really important for the mental and physical health of kids, as well as for skill, uh, for skills. And of course, you know, for a, for a very small minority of kids, schools are a place of safety away from, a, a, you know, maybe a violent home. And, and being, being able to go to school every day is, is a relief for those kids. So schools yeah, provide I think we a lot of well, I'm sorry, to, but we read a report where schools, and I didn't realize this, are, are the number one, um, I guess, reporter of potential child abuse. Okay. They'll see different behaviors in the children. They'll see, you know, different types of clothing. They'll see, you know, teachers are with them several hours a day. And, and with the distance learning, you're not getting that, that in, even in that interaction with the uh, students. So mm -hmm. to, you know, pick up on those types of things that, or even if a student needs glasses, you know, maybe the pa parents don't even know, but the, uh, um, you know, the teachers will pick up on that. So, you know, we agree with you and you're right. This is a whole balance, a balancing act. I, I just, I want to ask you though, you're an economist. And one of the things I've been trying to do also through this whole thing is balancing the economy with the COVID and, and, and I guess managing in those risks and making choices safe choices hopefully between those do you have anything on the economy that you as far as businesses open and people going to work those types of things i'm just looking for your insight on that okay so i mean just just answering that it and in, in relation to schools and then answering it more broadly i think in relation to schools i mean i think you know, one of the things that schools provide is childcare. It's a place you can put your child while you go out to work. So the impact of parents not being able to go to work has just been huge. And, and you know, I saw a paper just, just today for this on the United States showing just the importance of, for the economy of parents being kind of kept at home looking after their kid. More generally, um, 
it, it's 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 very very tough you know i i um i don't think there's a you know i don't think we've all reached a clear conclusion i think the i think the um consensus is moving toward in europe is moving towards the idea that um you know the best way of helping the economy is to suppress the virus and then there isn't it's not an easy this or this it's not a i don't mean easy it's not a trade-off between the two and that, that you can get a long way towards you know reopening the cafes reopening the restaurants the bars everything if, if there's less transmission going on and it's going to be if we try and say hey let's just open everything up and um uh, you know open everything up and, and we'll kind of take the consequences nobody's going to go shopping if if they think there's a risk of serious harm um so, so you know we're all sat at home i'm you know i'm we're all sat at home saving our money not spending it um so the way to the way to get the economy started again is to um is to make real inroads suppressing the virus i think I, obviously not you know a long long way from easy but you know yeah. i think that i think that's how a lot of people are seeing it now it's not we we it's not lives or livelihoods so if we can save lives we will save livelihoods hmm. that's a good point that's a good very good point miles so, did you have any, anything else yeah i want to jump in because i think you were going to talk about it or maybe you weren't going to mention it but you know something that i'm seeing with a lot of the people that are making the decisions to close schools whether it's governors or mayors or whatever it is or or, or you know, uh, school boards is it's an easy fix now. Like, and I think you were talking about it with the headlines. Is you're saving lives now, and the consequences down the road are kind of hard to quantify. You may not know them. Um, you may never really know because it's because it's it, you got to figure it out. I, I, have you noticed that it's not really a question, but I just kind of think it's like the easy fix, and we'll figure it out down the road. And kind of like your study was saying, those consequences could be you know, way worse. Yeah, I mean you're absolutely right. I think the uh, the issues today, you know, if it's a, a a political role, you know, the issues of teachers being and parents all being very very worried is 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 much more immediate. But if your uh, if your children are going to take a you know a ten percent earnings cut for the rest of their lives, if we think about um, what's it going to be? It's going to be twelve generations of of children have lower skills because they've missed some school or a lot of school then if you think about the prosperity and the, the growth rate of of uh, san diego california the united states the united kingdom europe if if something like a quarter of the workforce have got lower skills then there's going to be less growth and we all know how important economic growth is for the prosperity of a, of a nation or, or a state and but that's going to happen in 40 years time you know most of the politicians, most of the decision makers now find it very, very hard to grasp that. I mean, we know this from climate change, that anything that's painful now, but good in the future, you know, doesn't get done. Yeah. yeah. Well, Miles, you want to kind of wrap us up here? And yeah, well, Simon, I really appreciate you doing this. And, and, and you know, I think that, the, like we're talking about, it's a hard balance. It's not a easy fix, easy that is there. Yeah. Is there just kind of one final thing you should say to, you know, whether it's parents that are frustrated, like I said, we get a lot of calls, emails, please, please help us. Um, is there any kind of final word to, to parents out there? I think I don't envy you at all. I think you will be no doubt doing the very best you can for your kids. And um, it's not going to last forever. I'm sure your kids one day will thank you for your efforts to educate them. Very much. We appreciate your time and effort. And, uh, 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 and inside from the UK, and, and I think uh, we, we do all share in common. We want to keep our kids educated and do it in the safest, most pos possible way. So thanks for your insights. Well, thank you for inviting me, and all the best.